Thank you, Jesus. Awesome Jesus, in all your ways, you are merciful. There's no one like you, Lord, in all the earth. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Good evening, Dennis. Good evening, LaShonda. God bless you too for tuning in at this moment. Amen. God is so good. His mercy endures forever. What a mighty God we serve. Facebook messing up again. Hey Amen. I pray you having a great day. Pray that all is well with you both on today. Hey Amen. Well, it's 604. We're going to go ahead and get started. The, the Bible says, with us two or three gathered in his name, there he is in the midst. The Lord is in the midst of us this evening. And I'm, I'm excited about the word of God. I'm excited about teaching the word of God because it's changing my life as well as the lives of many others. So I just pray you stay encouraged on today. Continue to put God first. Let him be the lead and guide of your life on today. No matter what you encounter, go through. God is faithful to his word to keep you secure in his presence. <clears throat> in spite of the trials and the tests and tribulations we encounter, God is able to keep you from falling, present you, present you faultless before the brightness of his glory with exceeding joy. And that's good to know that God loves us so much unconditionally and no matter what we go through in this life we have the victory but we have to believe it by faith the only way we have victory is when we can change our mindsets and our attitudes to line it up with the word of god to believe that we are victorious through jesus christ our lord amen hallelujah glory to god All right, we're going to go ahead and open up in a word of prayer, and then we will go into our lesson tonight. This Facebook messing up again on my end. I pray that it clear itself up. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, you're the most holy and sovereign Lord. You are the King of glory and the Prince of peace. You're the everlasting Father. We thank you, Lord God, for this day that you brought us through. We thank you for keeping us secure from danger, seen and unseen. Let us travel from our homes to different places and return back safely. Someone left their home, God, and never made it back. But we thank you that we are your children and that you have angels watching over us all day and all night to keep us protected from the attacks of the enemy that will come on any side to destroy our lives. But tonight we come to acknowledge your sovereignty and your holiness, God, because without you, we would have never made it this far. We ask tonight, God, to speak to our hearts by divine revelation, loud and grafted words that be manifest in our lives with meekness to save our souls, to change our minds, change our hearts, change our lifestyles, that everything we do will pattern after the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Tonight, God, have your way in our lives. Speak to our hearts by divine revelation. Let the word of God come forth with power and authority to convict, to reprove, to chastise, to strengthen, to empower, to make us better 
in our everyday walk with you, God. As we go out, your word tells us, go into the world and make disciples of men, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, that we walk in obedience as servitudes, surrendered to your lordship, to your authority, that you would lead God and direct us in the path of righteousness and truth. Remove the busyness from the day from our minds. We have a clear conscience and focus to hear your word and allow that word to marinate in our hearts for the better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Am I coming across clear, anyone? Hallelujah, Jesus. We glorify you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Amen, amen. Last week, we left off in our discussion regarding all that can be shaken will be shaken. And the word shake is a word that's defined as to move up or down, side to side with rapid, forceful, jerky movements. Not only does it mean that, but it also means move of a structure or area of land to tremble or to vibrate. And that's one thing we realize that people have many different reasons for shaking. Some have a, a medical condition that causes them to have a shaking. Good evening, cousin. God bless you. They have a reason for shaking. Some is, uh, whatever that disease is, uh, it's a disease that causes them to have a trembling in their body. I forgot what the word is. But they, they tremble. They have these tremblings and they just constantly shake out of control and have no control over it. Then you have people when they're disgusted, they shake their head in disbelief. Or if you hurt your hand or stomp on, someone stomp on your toe or you drop something on your foot, you shake your foot trying to remove the pain. But the type of shaking we're talking about tonight is the shaking in the spirit. Because there are things that have been attached to our lives through generational curses by the enemy. And it wants us to get into a position where we're bound in bondage and in captivity. And the Lord has given us his word that even in the midst of the shaking, there's a sifting. Which reminds me of the, the parable when Jesus was talking about, when he said in his word about the, the, the vineyard, that he had sent laborers to the vineyard and they were working and the owner of the vineyard had left, but he gave certain people part part of some denarii to, to go and be productive in his vineyard, that when he come back, he'll receive a reward for what he has sown in their lives. And many times the word says, give and it come back to you, good measures, pressed down, shaking together, running over your men, give it to your bosom. That's a shaking. That sifting is where they would take the, the fragments uh, of the harvest and put it in their garment and shake it together and cause whatever fragments that to run over be for the gleaners. And one thing about God, God tonight is trying to shake things in our life to make us better, to perfect the thing that concerns our lives. And the enemy wants to get you to a place where you can't see what God is doing. I was looking up in um, gotquestions.org gotquestions.org it's a really great tool you can you can find a lot of different biblical answers to questions you may have concerning the word of god and one of the subjects it has in here is um what does it mean that satan wanted to sift peter as wheat so in luke chapter 22 verse 31 it says the lord says simon simon behold satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat, verse 32. But I pr have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brother. It says, at the Last Supper, Jesus warned Simon Peter that a test of faith was coming. Simon, Simon, indeed Satan asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, the outspoken disciples seemed to be in the same predicament as Job was when Satan sought to put him to the test. In Job chapter 1 and chapter 2, you'll find that encounter. Satan wanted to sift Peter as wheat, which means that he wished to shake Peter's faith so forcefully 
that he would fall, proving that God's faithful servant was lacking. And that is very interesting because every day we're tested. Every day we're tried. And the enemy wants to get you to a place where you're not listening to the voice of the Lord when he's speaking to you. He gets you distracted by people, by things you're doing in your life, different events. There are various reasons why we get distracted and get stuck into a certain mindset of rebellion because we're not focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. And God wants us to know tonight that he wants to redirect your focus back to the word. See, we, we find ourselves gravitating to so many things of the flesh and feeding on the things of the flesh of the world, which causes us to begin to depreciate in our faith in God. And God is saying tonight, I want to empower you in your faith, that your faith will be stretched, your faith will be strengthened, your, your faith will be be connected to the God kind of faith that will begin to move mountains in your life. The reason uh, in Mark chapter 11, verse 22, when Jesus said, you speak to the mountains and the mountains will obey you to move and you cast us into the midst of the sea and it will obey you. Why? Because the power of the word of God, when we speak the word, we're lining up our conversation with the word, which is the great I am. If you understand that in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, St. John chapter 1, verse 1, the word was the great I am, which is Jesus Christ incarnated in the flesh. So as the word begins to reveal itself, he, Jesus tells his, his, his disciples, he said, that, he said that he's a light that comes into the world and darkness cannot extinguish it or cannot put it out. Why? Because the word illuminates. We talked about this in previous lessons, how the word has the ability to expose the hidden crevices of sin in our hearts and the darkness in our lives in order to make us better and come to a place of repentance. Until we have a repentful heart, our faith would never grow in the things of God because we're allowing ourselves to be stuck in a sinful mindset, which depletiates your faith. Sin depletiates your faith. And it causes your faith to begin to become lesser and lesser influence to believe in the things of God. And God, so he told Peter, Satan wished to shake Peter's faith so forcefully that he will fall. And that's what Satan wants to do in your life. He wants to get you in a predicament where you are tested, where you quick to fly off the handle, you cut somebody out in a minute, you have a na negative attitude, a nasty spirit. He, he wants to get you to a place where you forget about your redemption. Forget about your salvation in Christ Jesus and allow that fleshly man to overpower the Holy Spirit inside of you. And tonight, God wants us to be aware of the system. There are things in our life that God has to shake off us. Sometimes we have a spirit of anger. God needs to shake it off of you. Sometimes you have a spirit of complaining. God has to shake it off of you. Sometimes we have a spirit of malice and jealousy and hatred of somebody else because of what they have and I don't have, that covetedness. God has to shake it off us. Sometimes we have a, a temptation to want to fornicate and adulterate and become a liar and a manipulator and deceive many people to make things appear to be true when it's a lie. Why? God had to shake it off us because that's the mind of the flesh. It was not just Peter who was in danger, though the word for you in Luke chapter 22, verse 31, is plural. Plural is a word means more than just one. Jesus was speaking to Peter, informing him that Satan had his sight set on all the, the disciples. Some translations, such as the Berean Bible uh, trans, translation, specifies the whole group, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like we. So it wasn't just Peter. Jesus was referenced to. It was the disciples as a whole because he knew that they were in a position where Jesus was about to lead them. And when he leaves, they're going to be tested. They're going to be tried. They're going to be proven. And they have to continue to stand on the word of God. And he knew that when the time comes of his departure, disciples were going to receive such great discontentment and unbelief. Like how could this happen to our Lord and Savior who we followed these three and a half years? Why, why, why did God allow this to happen? So he knew that faith was going to be tested to a place. They're going to begin to walk away from truth. They're going to, they're going to abandon the faith. 
They're going get, to get in a place of sorrow, a broken heart, become filled with misery, and go abandon Jesus and hide. He knew this was going to happen. This was nothing unusual. Sift as wheat is a metaphor that could also be expressed as to shake someone apart or to break a person down. Amos chapter 9, verse 9, it says, and this is the English Standard Version, Amos chapter 9, verse 9, For behold, I will command and shake the house of Israel among all the nations as one shakes with a, a sleeve, a sieve. But no pebble shall fall to the earth. So God says, I'm not going to lose any one of you. Even in the midst of shaking, I still have the power to sustain you and keep you in my will. It says, it gives us a similar image of God shaking Israel. For I will give you command. I will shake Israel along with all of the nations as grain is shaken in a sieve. And not one of the true kernels will be lost. And that's the New Living Translation. In biblical times, wheat or other grains were sifted through seeds or larger strainers. As it was shaken violently, violent, violently, the dirt and other impurities that clung to the grain during the threshing process would separate from the good, usable grain. And that is so awesome because there are things in our lives that have been attached to us, as stated earlier, through generational curses. And those things make us seem like it's the normal way of life, the normal behavior pattern, the normal way of thinking when I'm contrary to what God says about me. So anything attaches itself to your psyche to make you doubt God's word and God's ability to keep you is of the devil. And, and God says that even in the midst of the shaky, there's some usable parts of you that I can use. There's something about you that's unique that I still want even though you're going through your trials, you're going through your tests, you're going through your tribulations, going through your persecution, you're going through the plank, the place of being hurt and being being all put down and ostracized, all the different things. There's so much we go to as a go through as a child of God. And God says, but in the sifting, the strainer, you know, I, I'm thinking of something. How when you're about to bake a cake and you get your flour, you take out your, your, your sister is an instrument that's used that has a screen in the middle of it and it has a bracket that turns to sift whatever's in that, that, uh, that flower to shake it loose. And you begin to put the flower in the sifter and you turn the cranking wheel and it begins to shake and, and move this debris of the flower that's thick and that's clumpy to make it findable to be used. God does that in the spirit. He shakes up our hearts. The things that are in our heart, the debris of the, of the sinful nature, the stuff of the enemy that attaches itself to us to prevent us from walking in our purpose and the plan God has for our life, he's sifting it. He's sifting it out of you that you can be applicable to receive the word of God. And the word of God will be applied to your heart and begin, God said, now I can use you because now I got your focus right back in order. I got your mind back in the place you need to be in me so you can think godly thoughts. Think healthy thoughts. Speak the word of God over yourself, over your finances, over your children, over your marriage, over your, your possessions. Speak the word of God over everything that God has given you that anything that's not of God will be sifted out of it. Your motives, your ambitions, your desires, God is sifting. Not only that, so it's in sifting, the other disciples, as we, Satan's goal was to crush them and wreck their faith. In the sifting of Peter and the other disciples, Satan's purpose was to break down their faith, cause them to lose their faith. In truth, the adversary wants to destroy the faith of every believer. You know what I just said? The enemy, he knows every person, a child of God, has been given a measure of faith. Some faith is stronger than other faith. Some people believe system stronger than somebody else's belief system. So like I can speak the word, tell my body to be healed, and I have just great faith belief it's going to happen. Some people speak the word and it never happens because they're not having enough faith to believe that it can happen. They, they speak faith out of their mouth and doubt at the same time. Which reminds me of James, when James talking about 
in chapter 3, he's talking about how how the tongues of little member boast of great things. He said, blessing and curses come from the same mouth. Why? Because I bless myself, what God says I can be blessed with through the word of God. But then I doubt the word of God, so I curse myself. So I curse myself from growing in my faith because I keep doubting what God can do in my life. We, we say every Sunday morning in our church service, when we give our offering, we say, Lord, enlarge our territory. Whatever it is your territory, God wants to expand it. He wants to increase it. He wants to make it abundant. But he can't do that if you're still holding on to the spirit of doubt. That sifting, when sifting takes place in our lives, it changes the mindset of a believer to go beyond the reasonable doubt. When you go to a court of law, they say we have evidence beyond the reasonable doubt to prove this person is innocent or prove them guilty. And God says when you're on trial for Jesus Christ, when you're being sifted, will they have enough evidence to convict you that you are a child of God? Or will they have enough evidence to prove that you're a doubter? You're a non-believer. You're a hypocrite. You're a liar. You've been cheating and, 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 and faking like you're a child of God. But all the, all the time, your intentions, your motives were wrong. You never really were serving God from the heart. You have a lot of people in the body of Christ, they serve God out of emotions. This is good. They serve God out of emotions. And their emotions make them feel good when they hear the word. Their emotions... Make them feel good when they hear a good prayer. Their emotions make them feel good when they hear a good song. Or when they leave out the door of the church, they go back to the same environment of fear, doubt, and unbelief. So I don't consecrate. I don't spend time in the presence of the Lord. I don't pray in my own house. I, I flow to my flesh. I devour the things of the world every day because I'm fleshly. Paul had a reason in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We get a chance to read that whole chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He had a reason to come to the church at Corinth and tell them, I hear there's feuding and bickering among you. He said, why? He said, by this time, so you should be maturing in the things of God, but you're still acting like mere men. You're still acting like babies design the milk of the word. He said, you need to grow up and want the word of God to mature you. The reason why so many people struggle with overcoming the flesh desires is because they really don't want to. Just plain and simple. They really don't want to. If I really want to change something in my life, let's say I overeat all the time and I want to stop overeating. I want to begin to change the way I think about myself when I begin to devour any substance. I'm going to hear the Holy Spirit tell me, when I eat it, eat enough, now you're done. Put it away. And the Holy Spirit says, just like when people want to drink alcohol, God didn't say nothing wrong with drinking alcohol. He says overindulgence. He said, well, to be sober in the Spirit, in the things of God. So if I'm not going to be sober, I'm going to constantly be drunk. And, and that's what the enemy wants to do. He has to distract you with the things in your life to entice you to, to downgrade your faith. Here I just said he wants to downgrade your faith. If he can stop your faith from being productive in the spirit where you speak things into existence, overcome the enemy's temptation, trials, and tests because of the word of God, begin to speak the word, he knows if I can stop you in your track. You never overcome the little bitty things in your life that's hindering your faith from growing. Then it goes on in John 10, 10. But Jesus assured Peter, I have pleaded in my prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. Luke chapter 22, verse 32. Luke 22, verse 32. Peter's leadership role in the early church proved that the Lord's prayer for Peter was answered. So you, we all know the story of Peter. How he began as one who was quick-tempered, hot-headed. 
but one who denied Jesus three times. And Jesus said, even though I know you're going to deny me, when you have been strengthened, when you regain your faith, regain your trust, your reliance upon God, even though we fall down sometimes, we get discouraged, we feel like giving up, we get faint-hearted, we wonder where is God, why is God letting this, this, this stuff happen to me, why are you letting death in my family, why are you allowing my children to die, why are you allowing my mother to die, my father to die, God, why this, why that, why this? And God says, it's all part of the system, because sometimes when God is trying to get our attention, we're comfortable in our mess. And God is trying to stir us up to draw us to himself. Especially those who claim to be a child of God. God will let events take place in your life to shake you up. If he didn't shake you up, you'd never come out of your comfort zone. If he didn't shake you up, he'd never, you'd never stir. When they say the words, that fan the flame is inside of you. So you never be stirred up in your spirit where the fire of God begin to get brighter and brighter and more intense against the powers of darkness. And God has to allow things to happen, to test, to prove, and to try our loyalty and depend upon him to make us trust him with all of our hearts and lean out to our own understanding. Because there are many things happen in my life. I still don't understand to this very day why they happen. But all I do is trust God in the process. Because the process, when I'm going through different trials, situations, troubles in my life, it only happens to define who I am and to make me better servant for the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus did not promise to remove Peter's impending, impending test. On the contrary, he predicted that Peter would fail the test by denying Christ three times. Luke chapter 22, verse 30, 34. Trials are to be expected in a Christian life. We must go through many hardships in the kingdom of God. We must go through hardships. It's guaranteed as a child of God, in order to be strengthened, you got to become weak. In order to become prosperous, you got to be poor. In order to be healthy, you got to get sick. Why? Because these are the tests to prove you, who you are in Christ Jesus. God uses, let me read something here. He said, we must go through many hardships in the kingdom of God and save the missionaries in Acts chapter 14, verse 22. God uses these experiences for our good, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, to refine our character and strengthen our faith. That is so good. God uses the bad things in your life to build your character. He used people to aggravate you, to just get under your skin, to always get you to a place of just, just being frustrated. He used those certain individuals to come into your life to push you to trust God, to change your attitude. If you're a negative person, God will let negative people come into your life to force you to change. He used experiences that you go through dealing with other people to make you better. If I never go through the test, I will never have a testimony. And then it says to make us more like Jesus. So in order to become more like Jesus, we have to go through some tests, some trials, some tribulations, some persecution, all types of stuff we don't have to encounter just to become like Jesus. If Jesus suffered, on the cross, you got to suffer on your cross. But the thing about the suffering, he paid the price for our redemption. His suffering brought us the right and the privileges to have access to tap into the frequency of heaven, to offer our prayers unto God when I'm going through. And it releases the anointing of God to flow into you to give you the ability to overcome. If I never get to the place where my ears are open to hear God's voice speaking to me, I will never become better every day. So I got to have ears to hear what the Spirit says to the church. 
I have to have a heart that's pliable for the word of God to be sown in my heart. Amen. So in our lesson, we left off last week talking about the sifting. Five purposes, five purposes for shaking an object. To bring it closer to its foundation. Number one. Number two, to remove what is dead. Number three, to harvest what is right. Number four, to awaken. Number five, to unify or mix together so it can no, so no longer be separated. That is so good. What is it, if you were to ask yourself this question, what is it God is allowing in your life to bring you closer to the foundation of Jesus Christ? The foundation is Jesus. We, we found it out last week. The rock. Jesus told Peter, upon this rock, I will be in my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So what is, what, what is it in your life that's testing you to bring you closer to Jesus Christ? What is it that's dead in your life you haven't let go of? Sometimes something dead in our lives is a bad attitude, is always a, a negative mouth, a broken spirit, wounds and scars from the past, negative influence, dead stuff that I haven't let go of. So I let dead things continue to multiply in my life. And God's are doing the sifting process. I'm removing the stuff that's dead in your life. I'm removing certain people out of your core circle who never meant you any good from the beginning. But because they were your friend for 30 and 40 years, you found it difficult of separating yourself from them. So God says, I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to separate you from them. Because they have a dead spirit and life and death cannot dwell together. Either I'm going to live or I'm going to die. You have death and life in the power of your tongue. Either I'm going to speak life over myself or let people keep speaking death or I speak death over myself. And God says, I'm removing the dead stuff off of you. Then he says, there are some things that I planted by the spirit inside of you that I want to harvest, to cause to become ripe, to become productive in your life. Jesus said to the disciples, the harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. Why? Because there are so many people in the body of Christ are not doing what God called them to do in the harvest field. There are so many souls are dying and going to hell every day because we're sitting in our comfortable churches and refuse to go out into the streets to, to spread the gospel. And God says, the harvest is plenteous. So your heart, I drew you to myself with my loving kindness. I placed my DNA inside of you, put my spirit inside of you. I put my character inside of you. I put my mind inside of you. I put my, my integrity inside of you. I put my loyalty and dependency inside of you. And those are the things I'm harvesting. To make you better. Then you have a group of people in the body of Christ who are still asleep. Spiritually asleep. Letting life just pass them on by. And God says in the shifting process, the sifting, I'm waking you up. Awake, oh slugger from thy sleep. God is trying to call you to wake up. He's trying to get you to the place where you begin to recognize the Spirit of God in you and stand on the word of truth. Because the Spirit of God is working in our lives every day to perfect us. But he cannot perfect us if we don't allow ourselves to get into the place where we hear God's word speaking by his Spirit. Truly God is faithful. He's sovereign. He's holy. He's majestic. He's just. And God is trying to get us to pay attention. Stop sleeping on the sidelines. I remember a scripture in Ephesians chapter 5. It was telling, let me, my friend, we'll go to the scripture. Give me one second here. Ephesians chapter 5. This is really a good lesson tonight. I pray it's helping somebody in their spirit to wake up, make you aware, make you discerning. To, to know when God is speaking and what you need to do and what you don't need to do. 
Because so many times we get stuck in a certain place. Let's see. There's a scripture here. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Okay, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14. And it says this here. It says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepeth, and arise from what? The dead. And Christ shall give thee light. So you got a lot of people who are spiritually asleep and the word is spoken, is held out in the atmosphere, is in the spirit realm to speak into your heart, to tell you, wake up. I remember when I was little in church, my father was a pastor. So I grew up under a pastor in church and I would fall asleep. And my dad would say over the speaker, wake up, Bernard, and I would jump. Why? Because it's startling when you're in a deep sleep and someone wakes you up unexpectedly, it shakes you up. And God is saying, I'm going to shake you up abruptly by the spirit that you will wake up and pay attention of the life that you're living. Pay attention of your adversary who is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Then he says, I want to unify and mix together so it can no longer be separate. What he's talking about? The body of Christ. His people who are so divided by the religion. God says, I'm not looking for a religious group of people. I'm looking for my bride who is unified, who comes together and encourage and strengthen and build each other up in the word of God. So anything in your life separating from Jesus Christ you need to allow the Spirit of God to shake it off for you. Allow God to perform an operation in your heart to cut it out of you. That nothing would hinder you from walking in truth. Any thought process or heart attitude that is rooted in selfishness or pride will be purged. You hear that? Any process, thought process, or heart attitude that is rooted in selfishness will and pride will be purged. As a result, this tremendous shaking, all of Simon Peter's self-confidence will be gone. And all that will remain was God's sure foundation. God knew Peter was going to get discouraged. He was going to deny Jesus. He was going to feel hopeless. Going to be sad in his heart. He knew he was going to get miserable. However, he knew that the foundation will remain. Because remember, Jesus spoke the word to Peter upon this rock. I'll build my church. The foundation, which was Peter, he was reminding him and disciples that no matter what you encounter, nothing's going to remove your foundation. Even though you get discouraged sometimes, people, God said the foundation is still there. But you got to wake up and recognize what foundation am I standing on? Where am I? Where's my security? What is my anchor holding on to? Am I rooted and grounded in Christ Jesus? Or am I relying on my selfish pride? Am I have self-confidence? The absence of God. And God is saying tonight, Things are going to shake you up. But then he goes and says he will be shaken to the true condition. The dead will be removed and the ripe fruit will be harvested, bringing him closer to the true to his true foundation. That is so awesome. God knows where you are, my brother, my sister. He knows where your heart is. He knows what's stirring you up, what's breaking you down. But yet he knows when the shifting and the sifting are going to take place. We're going to draw you back to the true foundation and reveal the true condition of your heart when you can repent and give your heart right back to Christ. He knows it. He knew he knows that he would no longer function independently, but would be inter interdependent on the Lord. God knows that. 
So he wants us to have our security, our confidence, our faith to be interdependent. So I'm entering into a relationship with Christ Jesus to totally depend on him and his leadership, his guidance, his perfection, his lordship, his chastening to make me better. Peter, Peter boldly countered Jesus' words. Lord, I'm all ready to go with you. Lord, I'm ready to go with you to both prison and death. The statement was not born of the spirit, but of his own selfish confidence. How many times are we quick to say things that we didn't really mean? We only said it because of the emotions, because the flesh was roused up. And that's what God is saying tonight. In spite of what you go through, be quick to hear and not quick to speak. He told Peter, he says, Satan is our sift is sweet. Peter says, okay, Lord, but I'm going to follow you even to death. I'm going to go to prison for you. And it, was, and it says it was not born out of the spirit. Why? Because it was out of the fleshy mindset. It wasn't the spirit mind. He could not see the foreshadowing of the shaking. He could not see the foreshadowing of the shaking. So this was the beginning of a shaking in his life. And God knew that this was something he had to endure. Something he had to go through. There are some situations in your life that God said you must go through. Just like Jesus. He knew in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he knelt down to pray in agony, being tormented in his prayer of going to the cross, but he had such bold confidence that I have to go through this shaking. I have to go through this sifting in order to bring redemption to mankind. I must suffer. I must be persecuted. I must be scandalized. My beard must be plucked. I must be beaten. I must have a crown of thorn on my head. I must be pierced to my side. I must die on this cross. In spite of, of what I don't want to do. The thing we don't want to go through in life, a divorce. We don't want to go through divorce. We don't want to go through separation. We don't want to go through pain of being afflicted, filled with infirmities. We don't want to go through this stuff. But it's all part of the process. The shaking must take place in our lives to perfect the things of God in our heart. If I don't go through persecution, I've never experienced the freedom in Christ. Glory to God in the highest. Judas versus Simon. Judas versus Simon. Some think Peter was a big talker and a cowardly. But in the garden, when the temple, when the temple guard came to arrest Jesus, Peter unsheathed his sword and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. You know what? When I read this in the scripture, and I'm reading this again as a recount, God showed me something, that every child of God got a Peter inside of them. We all have a Peter inside of us. We even have a Peter around us who's quick to defend you, who's quick to speak up for you, quick to fight for you. And that Peter inside of you acts out of the fleshly, emotional mentality, but not out of the spirit. John 18, verse 10 is an encounter. John 18, verse 10. I mean, yeah, verse 10. Not many cowards attack when they are outnumbered by the enemy soldiers. He was strong, but his strength was in his own personality, not in God's humility. That is so good. That is so good. My God, my God, my God. This is so good. He was strong. He wasn't a wimp. He wasn't fearful. But he acted out of his own personality and not out of the leadership of the Holy Spirit, out of God's humility. For the sifting had not yet begun. The sifting, even at this point, we cut off the soldier's ear, still was not the beginning of the sifting. It happened just as Jesus predicted. The same bold, strong Simon Peter was ready to die for Jesus. Wood and a sword in the garden full of soldiers was confronted by a little servant girl. Check this out. 
If you read the story in John chapter 18, you'll find this. He was confronted by a little servant girl. He was intimidated by her and denied even knowing Jesus. And you may ask the question, how could he bow down that quick to fear? How could he bow down to resentment of Jesus? That quick. Some think it's a big thing that caused men to stumble. Often it is a minor one that shake us up the most. It's those little incidents in your life that frustrate you. Just because somebody hit your car, it may make you angry, but it doesn't shake you up until they do damage to your car. Once somebody damaged your car, now you are out of character. Your mouth is flying off the handle. You're saying what's on your mind. Your personality takes over and God's spirit of humility went out the window. This shows the futility of self-confidence. Just like Peter confronted by a little slave girl. Do you know that Jesus? He denies Jesus. Then Peter denied Jesus two more times. Remember Jesus told Peter... He said, before the cock crows three times, you have denied me thrice. Before the cock crows three times, you have denied me thrice. So the first encounter, the little slave girl, then it says, immediately the rooster crowed and Peter left and wept bitterly. He was shaken of all his self-confidence and believed he would never rise again. So just because things happen, in your life doesn't mean it's over. That God has, has given up on you. He abandoned you. Let you stay in your storm by yourself. God is right there. In the midst of your test. To say hey I got you. I'm here for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. You can overcome this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not your own understanding. And all your ways acknowledge me. And I direct your path. So he reminds you through the word. I was talking on a radio show last week. How can I hear how I know the voice of God versus my voice and the voice of Satan and the voice of God? And one point we talked about was that when our ears are not attentive to the voice of the Spirit, we're not listening to the voice of God. If I'm always listening to the, the reasonings of the flesh to justify my wrongdoings, I'm not listening to the voice of God. I'm listening to the voice of the enemy. And then if my voice speaks, my voice tells me something contrary to God's word. God's word says I can overcome anything that happens in my life. My voice says, no, nah, I'm not strong enough to, to overcome that. The drug addiction, I can't overcome it. I'll never be free from alcoholism. I'll always be tempted to, to mess up. I'll never do things right. I'll keep making the same mistakes over and over. That's your voice. Satan only has the ability to put thoughts in your mind but he can't make you act upon it. Satan has the ability to put thoughts in your mind, but he doesn't have the power and the ability to make you act upon it. You have the choice by your voice. So whatever goes to your ear gate, it goes to your heart. And Jesus says it this way, it's not what goes to the heart that defiles a person, but what comes out of them that defiles them or corrupts them. All he had left, though he was not even aware of it, was what was revealed to him by the Spirit, the foundation. Simon, Peter, and Judas were similar in many ways, including the fact they both rejected Jesus in the crucial last days of Jesus' life. Yet two men had a fundamental difference. Yet the two men had a fundamental difference. Check this out. This is really good. Judas never longed to know Jesus in the manner that Simon did. So G Judas never wanted an intimacy with Jesus. He never really wanted to be acquainted with Jesus. He was only there as a peeper. He was only there as an assignment to lead Jesus to the cross, to deny him that Jesus would be put to death. It was all part of the plan of God. It appears that Jesus loved, it appears that he loved Jesus since he had left all to follow him, traveled in his constant companionship, and even stayed under the heat of persecution. He cast out devils, healed the sick, and preached the gospel. Recall that Jesus sent out the 12 to preach, heal, and deliver, not the 11. He sent the 12 out. Remember? Jesus part of the 12. Even though Judas had an assignment to deny Jesus, he still was under the same power of the anointing 
as an assignment. You know what? God showed me something a while ago. He said he could use a jack leg preacher under the same anointing. A preacher who's in church adulterating and fornicating. A preacher who's stealing money in the church. God said, I'll still use that individual because it's the spirit I'm using and not the person. He used that same person to draw many people in the harvest to salvation. But yet he'll lose his soul. Because what profit man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? So God says, even though he's a jacked up, messed up, hypocritical preacher, I'll still use the person for my glory and that person still dying go to hell. Because they haven't had a heart to repent. And one thing about the gospel, it compels men to come to repentance. So Jesus used the 12 disciples when he sent them out two by two. And yet, he knew Judas was a devil. And you may ask the question, why though? Because it all had to follow God's plan to bring salvation and redemption to mankind. If God didn't have a plan, we all would have been still in our sin. We've been dead a long time ago. But his sacrifices were not out of love for Jesus or out of revelation of who he, he, he was. So the revelation didn't come of who he was through Judas. Judas had his own agenda from the start. He never repented of his self-seeking motives. That's the answer right there. His character was revealed by such statement as, what are you willing to give me if I? So Judas had a selfish ambition. Read Matthew chapter 26 verse 14. 26 verse 14. He lied and flattered to gain advantage. Matthew chapter 26 verse 25. He took money from the treasury of Jesus' ministry for personal use. St. John chapter 12 verse 4 and verse through verse 6. Verse 4 through verse 6. And the list goes on. He never knew the Lord, even though he spent three and a half years in his company. So that, that lets you know, it's an indication. I can be in church for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and still don't know Jesus. And God is saying tonight, we need to wake up in our inner man and come alive. Come out the dead. Come from among the dead. Come out the dry bones. Come out of the place where you're, you're withering and dying. Come out of Lodibar, the place of no glory. Both men were sorry for what they had done, but Judas did not have the foundation. You know what they said? Both men were sorry for what they have done, but Judas never had the foundation. Peter had the foundation because Jesus told him, upon this rock I'm building my church. So Peter was planted on this rock. Because he said, your name shall no longer be called Peter, but Petros, meaning rock. Because he never hungered to know Jesus, Jesus was not revealed to him. He was not hungry to know Jesus, so Jesus was never revealed to him. And that's the same thing happening today. If you don't hunger and thirst after righteousness, you'll never know Jesus. Judas had a revelation of Jesus. He can never have betrayed him. If Jesus had a revelation of Jesus, he could never have betrayed him. When a strong attack was on his life, everything was shaken and blown away. When a strong attack was on his life, everything was shaken and blown away. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying an innocent blood. And they said, what is this to us? You see to it. And then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Matthew chapter 27, verse 3 through 5. Matthew chapter 27, verse 3 through 5. Because of his guilt, and his condemnation, instead of repenting, it caused him to commit suicide. So this is the first encounter of the scripture in reference to suicide. And that's what God is saying tonight. So many people in the body of Christ have committed spiritual suicide 
because they abandoned their faith. You committed spiritual suicide because you stopped trusting in Jesus. You committed spiritual suicide because you stopped walking in your purpose. You got saddened in your heart. You got broken, became miserable. You got in a place of guilt and condemnation and you fail to repent of that mindset that caused those things in your life. We're going to stop right here. We'll pick it up next week, the continuation. But I'll read one more point before we, we finish. He was remorseful and knew that he had sinned, but he did not know the Christ. He had no understanding of the magnitude of whom he had betrayed. He only said, I have betrayed innocent blood. He had no magnitude, no revelation, no understanding of the impact of who he was betraying. That's why the scripture says if the Jews had known who they were crucifying, they would never crucify the Son of God. If they had known the impact, the explosion going to take place around the world of the gospel, they would have never crucified the Lord afresh. If, if he had known the Christ as Simon Peter did, he would have gone back to him and repented. Knowing the goodness of the Lord, committing suicide was yet another act of living independent of God's grace. Committing suicide was yet another act of living independent of God's grace. The shaking revealed Judas had no foundation. Even after following the master for three years, he had no foundation. Numerous converts have prayed a sinner's prayer, attended church, become active, studied their Bibles, all of this, however, without a revelation of who Jesus really is. Though they confess him with their mouths, when severe disappointments occurs, check this out, when severe, those rough stuff happen in, the, in your life, they are offended with God and would have nothing to do with him because of offense. All because you served him, as I said, stated in the beginning of our lesson, out of emotions and not out of the love of God, out of the spirit. God never did anything for me. I heard them say, I've tried Christianity, but my life only became more miserable. Or I prayed and asked God to do this, and he did not do it. They never laid their lives down for Jesus, but tried to align themselves with him for their own benefit. They served him for what he could give them. They easily are offended. Here is Jesus' description of them. Who, when they have heard the word, immediately received it with gladness. And when they have, they have no root in themselves, so, 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 so endure it before time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake. You know what I just stated? Your persecution, your tax, your afflictions only happens in your life for the word's sake. And immediately they are offended. All because of the word's sake. Notice that they notice that he said they were quickly offended because they had no foundation. In what we are to be rooted, we find the answer in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 through 18. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. We are to be rooted and grounded in what? Love. Our love for God is our foundation. Jesus Christ is that love, that solid rock. Jesus says, no greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. St. John chapter 15, verse 13. St. John chapter 15, verse 13. We cannot lay down our lives for someone we do not trust. If you don't trust your spouse, your mate, you're not going to lay down your life for them. So when someone comes to attack your spouse or your mate, you're not going to get in the way to protect them because you don't trust them. We cannot lay down our lives for God unless we know him well enough to trust him. We cannot lay down our lives for God, unless we know him well enough to trust him. If I don't trust God, how can I trust in the Savior who died on the cross for me? We must have the assurance that he would never 
do anything to harm us. We must know with confidence in our hearts that God will not allow anything to happen to you because he loves you and he protects and provides and he keeps you from the evil one. So we're going to stop right here and we'll pick it up next week depending on God's character, depending on God's character. <sighs> Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. So I pray this has been helpful to somebody on here tonight. That you heard something tonight that would inspire you. <laughs> Study your word. Get in your word. Meditate on the word. Pray. Fast. Let go of those plates sometime. Let go of that television. Let go of the radio. Get into the presence. And one thing I'm going to say, there's one point. Fasting does not always mean fasting from food. You can fast from any other thing that you find yourself indulging in the most that prevents you from getting into the presence of God. So tonight, I pray that you have heard this word in your inner man, and that your inner man will be enriched and be persuaded to deny yourself, to take up your cross and follow after Jesus. If you're on here tonight and you know that you have been living a hypocritical life, you don't know Jesus, Lord and Savior, you might be one who was a backslider, who once walked with God and because of afflictions, temptations, and trials has come in your life, disappointments, you abandon your faith in Christ Jesus. You got very little faith to hold on. I encourage you tonight to allow the Lord to come into your heart, to cleanse your mind, to strengthen you in the area the most you need him, to overpower the mindset of the flesh, to sift away the things of your life that's preventing you from living the full purpose and potential God has placed in your heart. So I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this word. I pray, oh God, that you forgive me for my sins, knowing and unknowingly. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you for giving me another chance to make things right with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the whole host of heaven is rejoicing over one sinner that's made a decision to give their life over to the Lord. Even a backslider. God said he's married to you. He loves you. He restored you. If you were a backslider and you knew you were the backslider, you just got restored. And God is going to refresh you. He's going to revive you. He's going to resuscitate you. He's going to inspire you even more to get in your word, to begin to hear his voice. Because sometimes we get clouded in our ears from people and things around us where we can't hear God's voice. But God says tonight, I'm unstopping those deaf ears. I'm opening your heart to make it pliable. I'm changing that mindset of yours. I'm giving you a new spirit that's connected to me relationally that you would know me and the power of my resurrection and be conformable to my death. That you live your life to the full in Christ Jesus. So, Lord, I thank tonight for this word. Pray, oh God, and convict all of our hearts to change. Areas of our life that we know we have not been living right, oh God, and we can take a moment and just begin to examine our hearts, that you expose it, God. Reveal it. Uncover it. Change us, God. Unclose the nakedness, God, of the things that we have hidden. We cover ourselves in dead things, oh God. Make us naked. They can be clothed in Jesus Christ that you would strengthen the weak and the feeble, increase our faith, stretch our faith beyond limitations to trust you at your word, that everything you spoke in your word, every promise for us is yes and amen. And I thank you that we have a repentful heart every day of our lives to walk by faith and not by sight in the word of God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. There's a link at the bottom of the live stream, if you want to support our ministry, our, we have the um, project, a building project we're doing for our church. And if you want to sow a seed into that for the expanding of the church, every seed you give will go back into the church. I do it every time I get something from the Bible club, I put it right back in church. So I, I want you to know that every seed you give, trust God in expectancy that it'll come back to you. And it's a guarantee God will bless you because of the obedience 
It's not about the amount you give. It's about the obedience of being obedient to God's word to sow your seed into the ministry. If you're being fed by this ministry, then you ought to sow a seed. Because God has placed you in a place where you can receive a word to help build you up in your inner man that you can grow in grace and in the knowledge of who he is. So we're not going to try to bleed the sheep. We're not going to try to manipulate and force you to give. You give out of your willingness and your obedience to the spirit of God. We're not going to even try to bring condemnation because you choose not to. But I just pray that you be touched in your heart to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, to give into the ministry. And I guarantee God will give back to you again. So any questions, any questions tonight before we go? Any questions or comments? Any questions? Thank you for your comments too tonight on here, everyone. God bless you, Pastor Denise. Pray you're healing up well. And uh, uh, Minister Deborah, God bless you. That God is healing you both. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I pray you're being strengthened. Your, your, your joints and marrows are being restored. We pray the word of God is manifesting in you to heal you and deliver you from your infirmities. Hallelujah. Amen. So no questions or comments. I thank my pastor for coming on too. I just saw you. On, he was on here a minute ago. Pray God continue to bless you all. Well, you all have a good night. Stay encouraged. Stay excited about Jesus. And again, study the word to show yourself approved of God. A workman need not to be ashamed. Rightly divide the word of truth. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and he give you peace. Until we meet again next week, shalom. May the peace, the blessing, and favor of God rest upon your life. Until next time, have a blessed and a prosperous night in the presence of the Lord.